So I have the honor to uh, present Dr. Uh, our dear Pablo, Pablo du Bo, mm -hmm. um, who has uh, recently joined, the, or recently, or some time ago, joined the Java team and uh, helped us with the uh, upload or two of Jetty, and also helped us here with DevConf, and make sure we all have a good time here. So, And you're doing a talk on a system level JDM, JVM. Mm -hmm. So here you go. OK, so uh, this is a. Uh, uh, this is a talk where I try to convince you guys about something, and you try to convince me not to do it and do something more productive with my time. <laughs> but uh, the first thing is, uh, is, is, is a battle cry, and I got a battle cry, and I know you guys are very sleepy, so the battle cry should wake you up. If this comes through the audio. The sound is... Mm, this here has to be on. I'm going to get it through this. So. That's uh, from Argentina. It's called a sapucay. It's a type of uh, thing that people scream while they are dancing. <laughs> So that's not our battle cry. I guess battle cries will be even more scary. OK, so uh, I'm uh, going to talk. Uh, most of the talk is going to be what it entails to build one of these multi-applications, JVMs. But I will first start explaining what they are, and most importantly, why we should care. Yes, uh, I have a, a really, really like great point about it, but it comes in like, like number 10. I could have just started with it, but uh, I, it, it will be a little bit momentum. So bear with me for this first slide that will be a little boring. Uh, so what are uh, multi-applications JVMs? So the idea is uh, to have a JVM that supports what is called it isolates, that are virtual machines that allow multiple applications or processes, tasks, depending how you want to call them, basically things that have a public static void uh, main. Uh, and different class paths to, to be running on the same virtual machine, yeah? And, uh, of course, these uh, different applications should not interfere with each other. And uh, that means you run them through and you should obtain the same results as if you were running them in separate processes. This, uh, you, know, you think about it a little bit. I, I, I came across the concept of isolate, uh, isolates when I was following a project, I don't know, I don't follow it anymore, I don't know the current state, call it JNode, that we're trying to build a whole Java operating system. The interesting thing about isolates is that uh, they are um, a standard, I mean, they're a JSR 121, the Application Isolation API. You can go to the jcp.org website and download it. It's a very, very small uh, uh, JSR. What you get is uh, this. You can say, I want a new isolate that is going to be running that application. And then you can actually start the isolate. And that will, that's this, this few lines of code are equivalent to doing a new process, launching uh, an external process with the JVM. Um, and you can also say this is the input stream, this is the output stream. And you can things call it links that let you communicate with these things. Um, and this has been around for quite a while. I mean, this is from 2006. So by 2006, this technology was to the level to make it into a JSR. And here's the most interesting part. I, uh, uh, until uh, <clears throat> very recently, I was working in a company that is very fond of uh, large monolithic Eclipse-based applications. So right now, um, many people find themselves running a, whole, a chat client written in Java, plus an email client written in Java, plus an office suite written in Java, and not really Java but itself, but all written in top of Eclipse. So you are sitting there in your laptop, and you are running three full Eclipse uh, applications. And you know, on top of that, you want to do something with your machine, but all your RAM is gone. Yeah. And, and you can imagine that as Debian Java becomes successful, people will have more and more applications they want to have running on top of uh, their systems. You, you can be you know, hosting a few Debian DVD torrents using uh, Azurius, well, now call it Woozy. You can be uh, having your desktop being indexed with uh, Lucene-based desktop search. And uh, you can be doing a voice conversation using SIP Communicator. There is even a SIP-based uh, 
that is uh, written in Java. And all of these things will have their own JVMs. And uh, I don't know if you have seen, but in Microsoft Windows XP, when you come to log in and you have been running applications, there is this small balloon that says, running multiple applications will slow down your, your system. Yeah, like you shouldn't really run multiple applications. Uh, so, you know, if you're running these six uh, different things, like chat and email and uh, whatnot, you should expect that your system is going to be more slow. But uh, the problem here is, well, with just-in-time compilation, with dynamic compilation, your code is being compiled multiple times for each of these things. That, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's was wasted time recompiling the code over and over, but it's just a startup. This is something, in a sense, you can live with. The problem is that all these multiple copies of, of, of the bytecodes are living in RAM in, in separate uh, places. And bytecode is very, very small. But uh, the, the machine code that results from that is six to eight times bigger. Yeah. And in a sense, this is the same thing as having jelly, a, a different copy of glibc loaded in RAM for every process you have. Yeah. I mean, Java is that bad. You, you are ending up with a duplication of, and uh, you're like, wow, that's true. This really sucks. How, how can we be doing this? And this is what we are putting our user through. One of the interesting things is you can say, this is off topic. You shouldn't be giving this talk in Debian. Go and give it in open JDK, Summit, or whatever. But we are the people who care about this. We, we are the distribution. We are the ones who put all these programs for people to use. E each of the different... Um, applications, the person who write the mail client, the chat client, they, they, they really don't care so much about this. We are the ones who are giving the user the experience. So the, building the uh, multi-application virtual machine is really more on the realm of OpenJDK. But the one pushing that, I think we're in a very good position to try to do that. So the, the interesting thing is, uh, this is a solved problem. Yes, I mean, since uh, the, the uh, 99 on, people on, on Sun Research Labs and, and other research centers have been working on that. They, they figured it out. These are some very good papers. Uh, all these three papers are from Uppsala, so they're published in good places. And uh, the project called Barcelona is even considered a Finnish project. They, they build systems that they ship on cell phones that they were modifying their, their Sun JDK to support the isolates. Uh, so, this is doable. We just need manpower and decision to, to carry through. So the rest of this talk, I, I'm going just to go through three different solutions for this problem. And uh, they are a little bit detailed uh, and technical with respect to how JDKs work. But uh, the whole point is this is not something that cannot be done. It's actually... Uh, I'm personally not an expert on JVMs at any point in time. And I read those papers and I understood, and maybe that's because I'm not an expert, I believe that can be done. But uh, so the, the simpler solution, so I, there are, I'm going to go through three approaches. Uh, the two of them don't require JVM modifications, and the last one is the only one that actually really works. <laughs> but uh, the, the simpler approach is you know, Java has this me mechanism called uh, class loaders. You can, uh, in the same way that you have reflection and you can find methods and stuff for different classes, in Java you can let the virtual machine call your code and tell how to resolve a particular class into an instance or, or a sequence of bytecodes. So with that, then you can get... Uh, uh, this type of things. So you, you can imagine you can implement that... Uh, isolate call by loading these things and start replacing uh, classes you already have in memory. So you can start sharing the, 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 compile, the compile code. Uh, of course, this, this does absolutely no separation between applications, yes. Uh, everybody accessing like system set out will set the output stream for everybody else on the same JVM. So the, this seems a little like laughable, this, like, this stuff it's not really allowing you to run multiple applications with the same JVM because it's strong interference. But uh, when you think about it a little bit more, uh, this is really very, very widespread use because applications of like Tomcat in reality are doing that. Yeah, they just use this, I mean, 
the JVM has a strict semantics that you can have all these applications running together and they will not interfere with each other if you use the uh, Java security system. Uh, you, you put a security application manager that stops any use of anything that you know wouldn't work on this type of uh, um, scenario. I mean, really, you are just use. There is no real reason why you can have so much restrictions on securities in a Tomcat uh, stuff if it's not work because you want to keep this isolation, uh, isolation working. The next, uh, uh, so okay, so the problem here really is that all these, uh, all these uh, static variables, you can access them from the different classes and you're gonna have trouble. So one of the first ideas that came out is this idea of saying what we need to do is to get the classes that has static fields, we just split them. And we have different static fields classes holding them. And we can do that on the fly just by modifying bytecodes. You know, things like aspect J, that type of things. So, so if you have a class like this that has uh, three static fields, then you, uh, on the fly you produce something like this where you have these other classes that contains uh, <clears throat> the actual fields. So every time when you were accessing the field before that it was just an access, now you have to go and look into this uh, array counter dollar s fields that is indexed by the total maximum of applications. So you know your application number two, so you're going to get the fields for the application number two and so on. The problem of doing this is that uh, you need to synchronize these accesses because you, for that moment where you access the fields for the first time, and you need to call the initializer. Yeah, so you need to synchronize here, and that completely destroys your performance. What's more, this destroys your performance on a static method that people normally use when they want to have something done very quickly. So, uh, so that paper is a 2000 paper. It. Uh, goes into a lot of, uh, I mean, does some benchmark analysis and find out that, for example, this uh, MPEG audio that is all static methods because it wants to make it very efficient, then <laughs> it's completely killed. Uh, but then they really wanted to make it work, so they, they, they don't really need a, a synchronize here if you can use this double check idiom and you know that your JVM will support it well and the, there are ways that if you know your architecture is going to do the right thing, if you check that it's not null and then set it, yeah, then, then those numbers come back to, to the regular uh, size. Still, you have overhead, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a little counterintuitive that to have this MVM stuff, you will get overhead. And that's uh, the, interest, the, the little uh, strange part of reading these papers is that they, they just keep talking about bad news. Uh, they don't really spend so much time benchmarking what do you gain from having this uh, MBM stuff. But uh, I would imagine that sooner or later we'll have our users just come in and knock into our doors to have this if we succeed on having a, a number of uh, desktop applications that are useful. Okay, so you still need a, a custom implementation of, of, of key classes on the system library to support this. I mean, the approach number one and approach uh, zero don't require any modifications to the JVM, but you still need a custom uh, system library. So you get, for example, a, a system uh, out different for every application. And, uh, and this part that is particularly tricky for, for Debian is uh, you have different system libraries for different architectures, because if you know that this architecture, you can check for the value and, uh, and then set it without uh, get into race conditions, then uh, you can do that. Uh, and, it's, and it becomes, you, you don't pay these huge penalties. Okay, so the real thing and is just doing the same thing that it was being done with this bytecode instead position, but just doing the, it inside the JVM. Uh, and it's really the same, the same thing. For each class, you have uh, 
in the place where before you had the, just the constant, now you have an array, and the array <coughs> has this different um, uh, pointer. So basically you are just uh, taking this same thing of having the fields into an array, and each, uh, each field uh, is, is a different object for, for a different application. Now, it's just that when you access the static field, the JVM internally replaces the direct access with a reference on the array. And uh, this is the cleanest way. You don't have to change any source code or, or uh, any of the, of the code. But, uh, well, you need to change the, you, you need to access to the internal of the JVM. And in the, in the paper, they, they make a lot of fuss about that this is only worth it if you have access to a very good implementation of a JVM that if you use like some of the free JVMs, you wouldn't really be able to experience uh, the total awesomeness of their work. And well, good thing is now OpenJDK is open and we can uh, try these things ourselves. The, mm -hmm. okay. Oh no, ouch. Okay, one of the most interesting things about this paper is, uh, uh -huh. ha, this thing. Besides dealing with the issue of the static fields, they also introduce something that is quite separate from the actual issue of um, uh, MVMs, but there is no real way to do Java native interface inside one virtual machine and still remain all this lack of interference semantics. Because, you know, your Java native interface sec faults and it will kill your 10 applications at once. And then, you know, you get this Windows experience type of thing. So, they, in the same paper, they introduce uh, Java native interface isolation where they run the Java native interface in a separate process. And they have the Java native interface object do copying. Uh, so, what you get here is the, the Java Native Interface object in C is actually a proxy that then does uh, uh, <clears throat> IPC to, to the actual multiple virtual machine. Uh, I was talking with Matthias about this on, on Saturday, and he, he really liked this part. The other part wasn't so much convincing. So hold on to this because maybe at least this is something we can start looking into and, and start uh, trying to have it. Uh, Any questions, comments? Okay, so there are still quite a bit of, of issues. Uh, initially, I was planning to have each of these to be a whole slide, but uh, I ran out, out of energy. <laughs> the, the, one of the, the things that they claim is very nice about this is that you can rehaul the whole um, heap allocation strategy and then have a larger heap for the whole MVM, and then when you launch an application with a given heap, you can get extra heap allocated if there are no other applications running. And they also go for the generational uh, uh, garbage collection approach and use um, the, um, the objects that you are sure you want to keep, they just bundle together across different applications because they are going to stay in, in you're not gonna garbage collect them anyway. The, no, they, they, well, the, the last segment of, of the multi-generational. Um, there is other bit that is very, very, very tricky, and I'm uh, going to try my best to convey it. If it doesn't come across very well, just uh, uh, make faces and I'll try to reply, re repeat it. In, uh, in just-in-time compilation, every time you access a class, you have to check whether the class has been loaded and initialized. But if once it has been loaded and initialized, you, you don't need to check for that anymore. So, so the compiler compiles the code with these little pieces of code that check whether the class has been initialized and then uh, it's, it's like self-destructing code. It's just like, okay, it's, if it not initialized, initialize, and then delete myself. And uh, we cannot do that in a multi-application uh, multi virtual machine because to preserve the semantic, you will still need to initialize in a different application for the same code. 
So you are still doing that check all the time, and that also incurs um, a little penalty, and also means that the, the just-in-time code you get is a different just-in-time code. Uh, you still need a few system classes that need to be modified. It, system, uh, the system, X, system class is always a, a, a good case that needs to be modified. And for reasons unknown to me, <laughs> they, they say that they don't support custom class loaders. And that's for me is a big you know, drawback because OGI bundles are all built on top of custom class loaders, therefore you will not gain anything out of Eclipse. Everything will be separate, uh, repeated, uh, even with uh, running on the same JVM. But uh, I don't quite understand why they did that. I do believe you should be able to do it too. Um, okay, so now I have s put together a few slides about if we were to have something like this within Debian, yeah, so, so in a sense, this is trying to say, well, as Debian Java, should, should we try to push OpenJDK to, to go in this direction? I, I'm interested in working on this myself outside of Debian, in a sense, joining OpenJDK and trying to get this implemented. Uh, and maybe other people are interested to uh, uh, making the mistake too. But uh, if we were to have this technology in Debian, it opens a lot of problems too. And this is just thinking ahead. What would it mean? Well, one of the first thing is, User being Java, if you have set it with update alternatives to point to the MVM, uh, now is a strange thing. I mean, it's now it's deploying things into a daemon that is running there. So, it's, way to think about it is screen versus bash. Yeah, so, and you have extra arguments about the the different uh, daemon you are launching things against. The <clears throat> Uh, the other thing is that maybe you want to have an MVM that gets boot upon, uh, that gets started upon boot, and is used as a system level. But uh, that brings again when well, it's running under which user, and it's really necessary. That's similar to Tomcat. I mean, Tomcat, you have a system Tomcat, and that's running as a Tomcat user. Um, more, in, more, more hairy issue is the. The bad, yes. You know, you, you have this application, it runs fine. Then you put in an MVM and um, some bug happens. And, and here you, you are getting in, interference between maintainers, yes. And uh, so it's, it's not just, okay, let's add an MVM to, to Debian and we are done. It's really, well, if we add it, then we'll have to put up with these issues, yes. And these are going to be very difficult to, to, to find and to track. And most maintainers will be well, that's not really my problem because, but the, in reality, in many cases, it may be just that this interaction is showing some bug on the code or it's just a bug on the MVM implementation. Uh, this is similar to the issue of just having multiple JVMs within Debian. And uh, I, I understand that as an issue of manpower, we're just moving away from having multiple and just focusing on OpenJDK. Uh, <clears throat> the other part is uh, I still don't quite get how are we handling the Java native interface libraries. Yes, I mean if the all, all if we are only supporting uh, uh, Open JDK, then you just put the Java native interface libraries there. But uh, in this case, the the MVM as a fork of Open JDK should take the same Java native interfaces, uh, Java native interface uh, libraries as the same native libraries as. Uh, the regular JDK, but I don't know if the location will be different. I mean, uh, you guys in the question answer before said that you, you put them in user lib JVM GNI, uh, JNI, the. Um, we put them in uh, user lib JNI, yes. Okay. Okay, so, so they are supposed to be shared between different uh, JDKs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that will be better. The, the part that I found very, very scary is y your, you still end up having Java packages that are no longer the same for different architectures. If you go with things like the approach one, where you have a different set of bytecodes for uh, different architectures, because you know that in that architecture you can do things in a certain way and there will be uh, no race conditions. 
I don't think we, well, I mean, you, you could build a Debian package for a particular application, uh, particular architecture that still just use Java. It will be really odd, but. Uh, It's not that far from how we do JNI today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, one of the best arguments that uh, uh, Matthias uh, had was, you're not talking about modifying one JVM. You're talking about modifying the zoo of JVMs we have for all the architectures that Debian maintains. So while, you know, landing on OpenJDK and modifying the, one of the, I mean, the hotspots to, to, to be an MVM for a I386 might be doable, doing the same thing for all the other JVMs and tracking all those bugs and stuff like that is a, a much larger enterprise. And another very interesting question is, well, but if you want native code and, and DLLs and all that stuff, well, we, we do have GCJ. So well, an alternative uh, view is just let's forget about these MVMs and just focus on contributing to GCJ uh, uh, and bringing it up to uh, speed. Any thoughts on that? Okay, so, so that's the larger ideas. Now, if we just want uh, some of this stuff, uh, the technology, maybe we can start thinking small and th say, okay, maybe we just want a cache for the just-in-time compilation results. I, I don't quite see the ca a global cache for just-in-time compilation results going to really address the memory duplication issue. I mean, if you want to address the memory duplication issue, you end up having an almost MBM solution. The only thing you are going to address there is the reduplication of the compilation time. Yeah, so the, the first time you, you get one of the class, you, you write the, the just-in-time compilation results into this cache, and uh, then you just get it from there. But still, because of these uh, initialization barriers, you, you only write there the code with the barrier, and you have to load it in RAM and then replace it uh, with the barrier removed after it has been uh, through. The, the part that uh, sounds uh, very promising is the isolates for the na native code. And uh, that's fairly independent from the MBM aspect. Uh, they still, the, the paper still has a gray area that I couldn't really get is in the, the fact of uh, when you ask a pointer to the actual RAM that, for example, an array has. But in that case, you wouldn't be able to do it uh, in this case. But uh, supposedly, the, the semantics of the Java Native Interface uh, object uh, um, allows you to copy this memory back and forth, and that should uh, comply with the uh, Java Native Interface specification. Would be, anybody will be interested in this type of feature? You know, be able to run a Native Interface code in a way that if it's sec fault, it doesn't kill your Java application. Uh, Mike? So, um, I think we might actually already have had something similar to that. Um, I remember when I used uh, Cafe with, um, with some JNI, the, and I had a seg fault in the JNI, and Cafe helpfully threw a Java null pointer exception and continued running, um, which is mildly scary, but I assume they're using a similar technique to the uh, to this and while with having it in a separate process. Um, so I think this might actually have already been done by some people. Okay, so, so you say that Cafe had that already in there most likely. Well, uh... um, back to the uh, t topic of uh, JIT caching, it seems to me that it might be possible to uh, avoid the memory reduplication by uh, compiling physician independent code and then uh, memory mapping it at which point I would expect the kernel to um, y y share the pages. Perhaps there's something I'm missing though, and this is just offhand. 
but uh, but if you have the static fields, those ones. I mean, yeah, those would have to be in, I guess, a separate section or something. But I, I think if you could you know, isolate the code itself, make that position independent, it might be possible to do something along those lines. Sure. Uh, and the MVM idea is very interesting as well, just a thought. Uh, that's a great idea. I, uh, do you know much about that stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too up on the details. It just seems like that, in principle, something like that might be feasible. Mm -hmm. okay. Just wanted to add that I, it seems to me that the uh, memory uh, data problem is bigger than the memory uh, code problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And second of all, uh, when you talk about uh, sharing the code, you're also making a uh, optimization for space trade-off mm -hmm. because the code can be compiled in a way that's specialized for your application. Um, uh, so just two things. One, one is a pointer and one's kind of a, a question. And the, the pointer is there's a very good Google I.O. talk about optimizing Java C for Android, mm -hmm. where they talk about things like just actually storing the class names mm -hmm. uh, is a huge amount of wasted space. So when you're memory constrained, you don't want to have Java lang string 150,000 times possibly in a piece of code. Um, and the other is just a question is uh, one of the advantages that I find in using Java is that when I get a heap dump, that is, that is the heaped up and, and having the system level JVM, it's almost like asking the user, well, just dump, dump the kernel memory and I'll take a look. Because there could be a lot of things in there now. Oh, no, but, but the heaps are, are isolated. In, the, the, in their uh, design, the heaps are separated. So you have your, your three classes, your three applications, each one has a two gigabyte heap. Okay, but when things go south, um, <laughs> It seems like you still may want the, the Uber heap, right? I mean, that's what really we're talking about. I mean, the JVM does have, uh, yes. it has a single address space, and now we have these multiple processes yes, within I, them. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple of years ago, it was interesting, uh, Peter Von der Ahe, who is a Java language developer, took the statics out of Java C so that we could have multi-threaded Java C. Mm -hmm. So it's only a small part of the problem, but um, so it, w it was an interesting example of trying to find those statics, which was kind of tricky to get them and get them out. Um, I believe, I, I was noticing on the OpenJDK site that there is a sub-project called MJVM, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to say that John Rose is the guy that's been blogging about that, and I think he even talked about it at the recent JVM Language Summit. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what the status of that is. Hey, Pablo, have you had a chance to look at that? Uh, nope, I was hoping this will get me the type of pointers. Well, um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I used to do performance at Sun and uh, obviously I've been aware of the Barcelona project for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so you asked for some mm -hmm. constructive feedback, so I wanted to challenge you just a little bit, Pablo. But mm -hmm. uh, the uh, people have brought up these points uh, a couple of times. One of them is, well, one of the ones that I just don't know technically enough about is we have this assumption that you're showing in the picture that if application A and B have the same dependent jar, mm -hmm. they were only loading that once. And I'm not, I assume that that's the case with an MVM, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know how that would work if it's actually in different class loaders or the same class loader and mm -hmm. how the security works with that. Um, so that's, that's the reason why they didn't address class loaders on Barcelona to begin with. They, they will just take just the regular system classes. Okay, and then the other thing that was pointed out is that the heap space for application space is necessarily has to be separate. Mm -hmm. So you, you might save the perm gen and you might save some other th smaller chunks of uh, memory, but probably the bulk of what your application is doing is going to be in the heap and that, that will be the same whether you have MVM or individual JVM instances. Um, another thing that will be the same is the file system cache for all the, the system libraries that are loaded. Um, that'll be the same whether you have MVM or, or single JVMs. Mm -hmm. um, there are some downsides to, to MVM. One is that you don't have the opportunity to do different uh, JVM tunings for each application. You have one for the overall JVM instance. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that wouldn't be a big deal, but it is a constraint. Mm -hmm. And then as you pointed out, Pablo, there is the risk uh, with, and I, didn't, I don't know how far the isolates go, but there is a risk that if the JVM crashes that it will impact all of the 
all the applications that are running. Um, and as you pointed out, there is some probably some penalty to pay for doing the isolation and teasing out the statics in the JDK and, and in the application code. Um, that being said, the whole promise of this is to get a better startup, and so it probably um, uh, probably would be really awesome for startup. And I think that the, you know, I guess what I've learned from doing performance work is, you know, it'd be there's nothing like measuring it. If we can find a good use case and then just measure it and see. Mm -hmm especially if there's something experimental with OpenJDK, even before we try to package it, just to sort of mm -hmm. see how big a win it might be. Okay, so this is uh, more or less it. And uh, I, with some luck, next step comp, I'll come and say, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> but, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at the MJBM uh, project that I'm hoping is still uh, going on. Uh, so do you contribute with OpenJDK? How is the, the process for contributors? Uh, I have actually, I've been uh, busy doing other things the past couple of years and I haven't been an active uh, contributor to OpenJDK. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm wondering if I can ask other people in the room to comment if mm -hmm. they've contributed to OpenJDK or tried to, if they have any comments about that. Who's actively maintaining the OpenJDK package? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's that's the elephant in the room, I think. Oh, sorry. Well, they're both in the room, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, they 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 are wearing an elephant suit. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so you, you don't communicate with upstream much for, for that, just. Uh... So most communication is uh, with IST. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you can see that as a, as a proxy, which uh, does collect patches and provides uh, built infrastructure to build OpenJDK. Mm -hmm. There are uh, only a few people, uh, two or three, inside uh, IST mm -hmm. who contribute uh, to, to OpenJDK or to real upstream development in mm -hmm. OpenJDK. Mm -hmm. So I would feel that, that um, some th things like that uh, being done within Debian mm -hmm. would very uh, uh, fast bit rot mm -hmm. and uh, would be unmaintainable. Um, so no, no, no. The, the idea of doing this is really within OpenJDK. It's just trying to push it from Debian, saying, "Well, we, you know, if you, if we want this, and we will take it, and blah blah blah." It's it's more uh, uh, more on, on that direction. Why starting from Debian rather than? Uh, but the, so the best thing then would uh, would be to maybe um, to integrate it first with with IST. Mm -hmm. um, that's something like uh, what was done with the uh, zero uh, VM, mm -hmm. and uh, which is now uh, being upstreamed uh, to OpenJDK. That's, that's the one used on, on HPPA? Uh, um, no, uh, zero is used on, on Spark, no, sorry, on S390, on PowerPC, mm -hmm. on uh, SH4, on MIPS, and. Okay, so any. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me while you, you were talking earlier about where you were comparing this to Tomcat, where you have a single Tomcat instance running as the user Tomcat with all of your web apps in it, is that when you're trying to move this into the desktop application space, there are a number of other issues. Your Tomcat, typically your Tomcat thing is not quite trying to write files as particular users, and it's not trying to connect to an X server. So the issue you're going to have here is that the user that your system level JVM is running at won't have the permissions to access your files. Um, and even running it as root won't help if, for example, your home directory is on NFS. Um, and it won't be able to access your X server. So I think for things like desktop applications, the best you're going to manage is having uh, a single JVM either for user or more likely for each session. I think mean, that's still going to give you quite a lot of win if what you're worried about is, you know, mm -hmm. 10 or 15 desktop applications. But um, I think running something where you're, um, 
the first time you run a Java application in your session, you get a VM, and then the subsequent times you just load it into the existing one, it's going to be a much better approach to try and take. And if you have a look at Dbus, for example, they already have all of the stuff on there for managing sessions and mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. So a lot of that's already there for you. But I don't think that you're going to make a, a system-level JVM fly, mm -hmm. but multiple apps in a single session, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that is possible. And what about uh, Mono? Does the command language infrastructure stuff? I mean, they have, they're putting a lot of desktop applications built on the CLI these days. I assume Mono has a separate process for each, but I've not looked. A, a set of what? A se separate process, like we have with Java at the moment, I assume. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Just to add a tutorial comment, they, they burn tons of memory, too. Unless I'm mistaken. Thank you. Thank you.